And we take uh, the features of these other countries. And essentially, when we did the research, that's basically what we did. Uh, we looked at what other countries are doing. We looked at ways that we transition into uh, something, some version of that. And you have Medicare for all. Hello, I'm Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. As the global climate strike approaches on Friday, September 20th, organizing in Connecticut is increasing. The new coalition, Connecticut Climate Crisis Mobilization, is planning a big Hartford demonstration on noon of the 20th. You can see their plans on their page on the Action Network. Or simply go to pepeace.org for a link to click on. Speaking of promoting enduring peace, look over its bold new plan calling for seizure and replacement of fossil fuel industries and visit its booth at the September 7th New Haven Folk Festival and Green Expo. It's at Egerton Park in the afternoon on the 7th and it's free. One of the very necessary measures to control carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the rewilding of a sizable part of the Earth's surface. Of course, you know what's going on in the Amazon, the deliberate burning of that forest, a catastrophe. But here's a story closer to home. In Bridgeport, Connecticut, there's actually a 400-acre forest in the middle of the city. It's called Remington Woods. It's owned by the DuPont Corporation and now it's under threat. Threat of obliteration from development. That's a very opposite of what we need for a healthy climate. There is a lot of local opposition to this development. There's a group called Save Remington Woods. Here's a bit from their video. More at PreserveRemingtonWoods.com. The New York Times reports that MIT will examine the donations given to that university by Jeffrey Epstein. He gave over $800,000 over the course of 20 years. We hope their inquiry will be better run than the one they did about Saudi contributions to the work of MIT. After the Saudi crown prince visited the college, MIT received a grant of $25 million from Aramco, the prince's oil company. Then after the murder of Khashoggi. There was such outrage that an inquiry was launched. And there was a final report. Richard K. Lester, the Associate Provost for International Activities, explained they were horrified by the murder, but he saw no reason to cut off ties to the Saudi regime. Of course, besides the Khashoggi murder, there's been tens of thousands of Yemenis killed by American bombs dropped from Saudi planes in Yemen. In this report on August 23rd, the Israeli right-wing paper, the Jerusalem Post, went out of its way to quote a, a Kuwaiti paper which claims that Israel intends to bomb Hezbollah and Houthi forces inside of Yemen.
But the idea that a member of the United States Congress cannot visit a nation, which, by the way, we support to the tune of billions and billions of dollars, is clearly an outrage. And if Israel doesn't want members of the United States Congress to visit their country to get a firsthand look at what's going on, and I've been there many, many times, but if he doesn't want members to visit, maybe he can respectfully decline the billions of dollars uh, that we, we give to Israel. Over time. Our featured segment on the program today is about the Medicare for All conference that was held last week in Hampton, Connecticut. Bishop John Selders is the organizing pastor of Amistad United Church of Christ in Hartford and a founding member of Moral Monday, Connecticut. He's been a preacher, he's been a teacher, an activist, and a musician for 40 years. But his passion for the immediate necessity of social justice work was reforged with the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. His life work has been encouraging that long arc of the moral universe in its inevitable bend towards justice. Bishop Selders. I want to thank the organizers of this event um, for thinking I had something to say that was worthwhile and meaningful in this moment we are in. Can you just look at somebody and say, we in a moment. Look, turn to a neighbor next to you and just say, we, we're in a moment. There, there's some stuff going on that's got me scratching my head. Right? Am I by myself or are you too feeling like there's something stirring that just doesn't make good, proper, and I would say moral sense? Associated Press Wire story dated March 26, 1966 contained what is known to have been the first published reference to Dr. King's lesser known but not, but I would say equally famous quotation about health care. He said of all the forms of inequality, justice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Amen. Thank you for making me feel at home. I heard one amen down front here. <laughs> <laughs> According to this report, this account, of course, you know, as things go, I spend some of my time in the academy. You got a site, and you got a document, and you got to just argue, and then you got to, you know, you, you know what I mean. But we least now have this report that Dr. King had some things to say about this thing called health care. <laughs> 53 years later, here we are in arguably the wealthiest state in the wealthiest nation in the world. And we're in a conversation about the same doggone thing. The same injustice, the same injustice. Well, I'm here, one, as a person of faith, two, as a person of conscious, three, just as a regular old human being, and four, I'm a black man, If you, just in case you didn't know it by now. I'm a preacher, I'm a father, I'm a college administrator, and I still don't understand that 53 years later, after we've elected at least one black president, after all of what we've done, we still are having this conversation. <laughs> Am I by myself or is something wrong here? There's something maybe nefarious afoot. There's something that I think we need to pause as people just of goodwill. I think, I think not everybody is bad. Not everybody is evil. Not everybody has got some problems. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to tell the truth. I do see a therapist every now and then. <laughs> Maybe you do too. <laughs> We've had some drama and some trauma in our lives. And yet as a people, as a, 
as a, as a group of people who have destined themselves for this time, seems like some things we, have, we should have already fixed. Seems like some things, there are just some things that are wrong. Huh? Hello? <laughs> That was an amen right there. I just, it was a digital amen right there. A nation fought a civil war over something that was wrong. Took them some time, but we got voting for women right a hundred years ago. Huh? We determined that we were going to change some things, and we did it. Why now have we not? fix this idea that everybody should ought have a right to health care. Well, let me just be clear. If you don't, if you haven't gotten the message already, I'm in favor. <laughs> Here is one voice calling for us as a people of conscience, care, and compassion to do all we can to course correct, not, not back down and not give up. These are the times and the moments that reveal themselves to us this age-old question of why are we here? What is our purpose? And what's my commitment in the face of corruption and absurdity? Thank you. I come home from work and I turn to my beloved, I'm just saying what I do. <laughs> I turn to my beloved and I say, what has stupid done today? <laughs> what has been tweeted out today? What are those fools down in DC doing to us today? Huh? We're living in such a time where I believe Foolishness, shenanigans, corruption, and absurdity are live and in living color. <laughs> and for me, the true compassion, the true question is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard or superficial. True compassion, true justice, it comes to see that an edifice, an edifice which produces beggars needs reconstruction. True revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of what I call poverty and wealth. If you haven't made the case already, I'm making the, if you haven't made the connection, I'm making the case that that nefarious business is about money making. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And with righteous indignation, it will look across the sea and the seas of individual capitalists of the West investing in huge sums of money in Asia and in Africa and in South America, which where I've just returned from, only to take the profits out with no concern for the true social betterment of peoples who live in those countries. And I say, this is not right. It's not just. So a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is proving and approaching what I will call social death. And so the question is, cowardice asks this question. Is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one take, must take a position 
that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because one's conscience tells them it is right to take a position. And I believe, like many of you, that just health care should be guaranteed as a human right. And And that Medicare should be available to every single one of us. Health care should not be for those who can afford it or for those who seem like somebody said they deserve it. Right now, as you know, millions in this country go without it. Huh? So. These things are immoral, in my opinion. And there's a noted Nobel Peace Prize economist, Joseph Steiglitz. And he suggested not only are these sorts of things immoral, but that we have to look at the cost of inequity. It is costing us people. It is, it is costing us our moral fiber. And it is costing us and doing a great deal of harm to our version of democracy. So I'm here, like I hope some of you are here, in part to urge our Connecticut members of Congress, Senator Murphy and Blumenthal, Representative DeRosa, Courtney, Hayes, mine Larson, <laughs> to sign a Medicare for All bill right now. <laughs> I'm gonna do one more thing. Where I'm from and where I hang out at, we don't just sit and listen, we participate. In my church and very often where I am, I ask people to share in this ebb and flow of speaker and awaiting congregation. So do me a favor, loose yourselves of anything that is encumbering you like a piece of paper or a pen put it down and and if you would just for a moment those of you who can and will rest on your feet <laughs> Frederick Douglass said I prayed 20 years and heard nothing then he said until my prayers turned into my feet I'm paraphrasing. So I think it is incumbent upon us to do stuff, to make what it is that we want to come true actually happen or actualize. So for me, it starts with speaking what I want to see happen. Y'all with me? Yeah. I'm just giving you the setup now, all right? So let's do just a little bit of what we do when I'm on the street. We do a little chanting. We do a little chanting, all right? Y'all ready? Let me tell you what you got to chant back. I'm going to say sign the bill, you say sign the bill. All right? I say sign the bill, you say sign the bill. 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 Okay, y'all saying that. So sign the bill. They can't hear us across Hamden let alone all the way to Washington, D.C. They got to hear us in Washington, D.C. Come on, one more time. Sign the bill! Sign the bill! Sign the bill! Sign the bill! Sign the bill. Sign the bill. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm an economist, and that means I talk about numbers and things going up and things going down. And so I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, give you some basic evidence on uh, this idea of Medicare for all, what it really means, and um, how it affects people in terms of the, what we know, what is the evidence. And uh, yeah, we did do this damn study. Uh, it's over 200 pages long, 
whether it's good or not, it's definitely way more detailed than anything anybody else has done before, which I actually found to be a surprise because it's not like the issue hasn't been around at all, but then when I started looking at some of these other studies, uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, meat in it. Well, we can get to that later, okay. So what's the question? So we've got a big study, but there's really some simple questions. Uh, the biggest simple question is, uh, when we say Medicare for all, what are we really thinking about? What we're really thinking about is, can we design a healthcare system um, that will provide good quality, universal coverage for everyone with no cost sharing, in other words, no co-pays, no deductibles, no premiums uh, um, at all. That you walk in and you have equal access, equal right to health care. So that's the first question, can we do that? Secondly, can we do it in a way that also saves money? That doesn't uh, explode the budget as some of the critics have charged it will? And the answer to both questions is yes. The answer to both questions is undeniably yes. There's really not much to debate in terms of the pure analytic questions. That is, can you design a fair universal system uh, and can you do it in a way that saves money? And why I say it's obviously true is because uh, every other advanced economy in the world is already doing it. Uh, not even close. Uh, so as, Sh as Shannon just said, I'll just give some numbers behind what she was just saying. So if we look at uh, the UK, Canada, Germany, France, uh, Australia, Japan. So those countries are spending between $3,500 and $5,500 per person on health care. That translates to about 9 to 11 percent of their overall economy, their GDP. Uh, and we, the U.S., are spending about $10,000 per person. So roughly twice as much. We're spending roughly twice as much per person, which also amounts to about 18% of GDP, and we're getting worse outcomes. Uh, there, there's no debating that. This is objectively true. When you look at, say, a, uh, a, one of the best measures of healthcare performance, uh, which is amenable mortality rates, that is, deaths that could be avoided through medical intervention. The United States ranks 34th in the world, and we're spending roughly twice as much as other economies. So, as a research question, can the United States design a system that is universally accessible, good quality, and lower cost? All we have to do is copy what other countries are doing. And we don't have to copy exactly, but we copy more or less and we take uh, the features of these other countries. And essentially, when we did the research, that's basically what we did. Uh, we looked at what other countries are doing. We looked at ways that we transition into uh, something, some version of that, and you have Medicare for all. So let me just give you some, some of the highlights of our study. So the first uh, detailed question is, what, and, and responding to critics, Okay, you're going to give people universal coverage. You don't have to pay anything. You can go to the doctor whenever you want. Uh, and isn't that going to explode costs? Because everyone will just be going to the doctor all the time. Now, of course, that's the most fun thing anyone wants to do is go to the doctor. We just love, especially if you want surgery. I mean, come on. Isn't that fun to get knee surgery when you don't need it, even if it's free? So uh, the, the question is, uh, how much will uh, care, how much will utilization of the system go up? How much will demand go up? And it will go up. It will. We actually want it to go up. That's part of the point. Because, uh, as our speakers have already said, we have a system in which we have roughly 9%, uh, 26 uh, uh, million people in the country who are uninsured right now. Uh, then we have uh, another roughly 85 million people, uh, and that's 26% of the population that are what we call underinsured, meaning they have insurance, but they can't afford to get sick anyway, because when they get sick, they can't afford the deductibles, they can't afford the copays, so they go without treatment. This is over a quarter of the U.S. population is under uh, 
this uh, category, underinsured. So we're roughly talking about 35% of the population that are uninsured or underinsured. All of those people will be able to get the coverage they need under uh, uh, Medicare for All. That's a given. So yes, demand for health care will go up because all these people who are not getting care will get care. On top of that, we have the other 65% of the population, most of whom live in fear of ever getting sick because it will uh, bankrupt them. That also goes away. So everyone will feel uh, that they are confident, they don't have to worry about changing jobs, they don't have to worry about losing their jobs, no matter what, they will have health care. That's what we mean by health care is a human right. Everybody gets it. Now, so the cost will go up. In, in our study, we assume that the cost of looking at the research, we said the system cost will go up by about 12%. That number, by the way, our estimate was deliberately high, higher than the figure that if you heard about this study put out, by this, it's called the Mercatus Institute that's funded by the Koch brothers. And their study, people said, oh, uh, you know, my study is, you know, way exaggerating things. Well, my, my study actually said that the cost of the system will go up more than what the Koch brothers sponsored study said. And the reason is because we want people to have the right to, to get the care they need. So we assume costs go up by 12% for the system. But then, then what? Well, this is the critical feature of Medicare for All, that, the, that we get massive savings at the same time. We get savings because we cut out the useless private insurance intermediaries. They're gone. Now, if you, if you look at more about the conference on next week's program. That's it for tonight. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.